In this video, I'm going to find out which Pokemon is better for a solo playthrough of Pokemon Yellow, either Starmie or Tentacruel. You might be a little bit confused as to why I paired these two together, because Starmie is known for being fantastic in Generation 1. That being said, poison types in Generation 1 are not thought of as being particularly strong. Well, we should just look at my tier list, because Victory Bell, Gengar, Nidoking, Nidoqueen, and Vileplume all have something to say about that. Plus, we really need to look at Tentacruel's stats, so let's do a breakdown of it as a Pokemon in Generation 1. It has 80 HP, 70 attack, 65 defense, 120 special, and 100 speed, giving it a 19.53% chance to critical hit. Of course, as you all know in Generation 1, the special stat is a combined stat acting as both special attack and special defense, so 120 special is, like, not something that you should mess around with. Tentacruel means business. Look at him, he's got his little folded tentacles. By the way, I love this art, thank you so much, Brian. If you are looking for more of Brian's work, check out the link in the description. He put this art together based on the original red and blue sprite, which I think is just fantastic. I really wish we had a similar sprite in Pokemon Yellow. Tentacruel's front sprite here is a little bit underwhelming in my opinion. And do you know what else about it is a little bit underwhelming? The fact that it has a slow growth rate, which is by far the worst growth rate in the game. But it's not all bad, because Tentacruel actually has a decent move pool. It starts with Acid Supersonic, and the move that solves everything, Wrap. Beyond that it gets Poison Sting, Water Gun, Constrict, obviously this one is not very useful. Then Barrier, which is very useful for the badge boost glitch, Screech, and finally Hydro Pump. Through TMs and HMs it gets a lot of really good moves. Swords Dance, Double Edge, Bubble Beam, Water Gun, Ice Beam, Blizzard, Mega Drain, and Surf. The standout moves for Tentacruel are obviously Wrap, Swords Dance, the Ice moves, as well as Surf. And as a poison type, I can see Barrier being useful specifically against ground type Pokemon. I'm thinking about you, Sandslash. However, this Pokemon appears on the Champions team, so it's quite far away. Let's focus now on the early game. With Tentacruel, it is quite simple, because in Generation 1, the poison and the bug type interact in a very weird way. They are both super effective against each other. This interaction was changed starting in Generation 2, so that's why it isn't present in modern Pokemon games. Having access to Acid, a 40 base power, same type attack bonus move means that I will have an effective power against all of the bugs in the forest of 120. This gives Tentacruel access to really easy experience right away. I'm sure some of you are still thinking that Brock is going to be an insurmountable obstacle for Tentacruel. After all, it does only have poison and normal type moves right now. But that isn't exactly how things work. After I defeat the second bug catcher, my Tentacruel already has 23 speed. So by defeating the third bug catcher and a wild metapod, I now have 26 speed ensuring that I will move first against all of Brock's Pokemon. I defeat the Mandatory Trainer in the forest, skip the Light Years Junior Trainer, and with that, Tentacruel is prepared to take on the Rock-type Specialist. His first Pokemon is Geodude. Against it, I go for Supersonic right away to inflict confusion. I know that the Geodude is going to deal more damage to itself than I will be able to deal with either Wrap or Acid. I follow up this status condition using Acid because it has a 33% chance to lower the target's defense. If Geodude has less defense, then it's going to deal more damage to itself in confusion, speeding up the process. Another reason I'm using Acid here is specifically because I want to save my Wraps for the Onyx. Once Geodude goes down, Tentacruel levels up to level 10, and now it is time to use Wrap to knock Onyx out. Note here that Onyx goes for Bide and I Wrap into it. If that happens, Onyx only accumulates damage from the very first hit of Wrap, not from every single hit. Also, I can use Supersonic to confuse the Onyx, and if it hits itself, then its Bide is cancelled. And all of those advantages are not even mentioning the main fact here, which is that Wrap in Generation 1 is broken. If you saw my Weezing, Arbok, and Muck video, you will know why this move is so great. In Generation 1, this move can infinitely trap the opponent as long as you are faster, and that is what I want to do against the Onyx. Despite missing here and there, eventually Tentacruel is able to finish off Brock's Onyx, and with that it earns itself a first split of 4 minutes and 45 seconds. I bet most of you did not expect it to be able to beat Brock that quickly and at such a low level. However, its competitor Starmie is going to beat Brock even faster. So now let's break down Starmie and talk about it as a Pokemon. It has 60 HP, 75 attack, 85 defense, 100 special, and 115 speed, giving it a 22.27 chance to critical hit. 
Now Starmie also has a slow growth rate, and that is largely the reason that I decided to pair these two Pokemon together. Notably here is that I think Tentacruel has the better stat spread when compared with Starmie. While Starmie's 100 special is great, Tentacruel's 120 is just way better. Starmie is faster, but being this fast is not really relevant in a solo run. Also the high base speed may actually end up being a liability against it, because its starting moves are Tackle, Water Gun, and Harden. Harden can be used to stack up badge boosts, but if Starmie gets a critical hit, all positive and negative stat changes are going to be ignored. As a result, it will likely do less damage. Honestly, for a solo run, Starmie would just be better if some of its speed was moved over into, say, its attack stat or its special stat. Now, a major difference between Starmie and Tentacruel is the fact that Starmie is not going to train nearly as quickly in the early game. The Caterpie and Metapod line, which are the exclusive bugs in the forest in Pokemon Yellow, don't take a lot of damage from special moves. They have decent special stats, after all, they evolve into Butterfree. But with Starmie, I didn't really want to train in the forest at all anyways. What I'm going to do is head straight for the mandatory bug catcher, defeat him as quickly as possible, and make my way into Pewter City. Now fighting Brock on minimum battles is definitely possible with Starmie, but usually in my playthroughs I don't find it advisable with water types. Once you reach Route 3, if you've done minimum battles, you're very underleveled, and these battles can become quite slow and painful. To ensure I'm not cutting too many corners, I fight the junior trainer in Brock's gym. By the way, I did not heal going into this fight, I figured it would be fine. Then the Diglett crits right away, doing a lot of damage to Starmie. Luckily, its next scratch does not crit. Starmie levels up to 7, which gives me exactly 23 speed, by the way. Looks like I'm gonna outspeed the Onyx as well, due to this battle. Santru goes for scratch, Starmie survives on 2 hit points, and I knock out his last Pokemon. This levels Starmie up to level 8, so yes, now I have the outspeed on all of Brock's Pokemon. And as you would expect with 4 times damage from Water Gun, Starmie sweeps his team in a series of 2 one hits. That earns it a first split of 3 minutes and 36 seconds. So Tentacruel, not bad, despite having to train a lot and use Wrap, which is generally very slow, it is able to remain fairly competitive in this first split. After defeating Brock, I teach Starmie Bide. This is going to be relevant in a little bit, and then I start fighting trainers on Route 3. While I do this, let's talk about Starmie's move pool. Because it's a stone evolution, it doesn't learn anything new through level up. However, it gets one of the best TM and HM learn sets in the entire game. It gets access to Takedown, Double Edge, Bubble Beam, Water Gun, Ice Beam, Blizzard, Hyper Beam, Thunderbolt, Thunder, Psychic, Swift, Skull Bash, Thunder Wave, Tri Attack, and Surf. I really want to just spend a moment to talk about the fact that this thing learns Skull Bash. It does not look like it even has a head. I do not know why it gets this move. I know the developers spent a lot of time with these move pools in Generation 1, but this choice makes absolutely no sense. One notable omission from this moveset is the fact that it does not learn Body Slam. However, as primarily a special attacker, I don't think it's going to need it. Overall, the moveset on this thing seems fairly self-explanatory. Surf and Psychic for same type attack bonus moves, and Ice Beam and Thunderbolt for coverage. This does leave me in a place of over choice. If I want to have Harden on my moveset to ensure that I have access to the badge boost, then I have to give up one of these powerful moves, and honestly I don't really want to give up any of them. But that's a problem for later in the run. For now, let's head through Mount Moon. In the cave I fight the optional super nerd to gain a little bit of extra experience. Also every time a Geodude shows up I just knock it out. In my first playthroughs I always play the vanilla game without encounters turned off. I don't know, it just feels more legit to do at least one run this way. After that I face the optional hiker for fast experience, and then the two mandatory trainers at the end of the cave. The first one is the super nerd, I grab the dome fossil, and then I face Jesse and James. This fight actually got a little bit close, the Meowth does good damage to me, I'm on orange health, then the coughing comes out, hits smog, but luckily I'm doing more than enough damage so I'm heading into Cerulean City. Now while I walk towards the Pokemon Center there is always a choice that I have to make. Do I face the rival on Nugget Bridge, or do I face Misty? Fighting the rival has advantages for Starmie, it is mostly a special attacker, going to be using Water Gun primarily, and as a result his team isn't that scary. Normally I'm worried about the Spearow using Growl, and then the Sandshrew surviving so many hits and stacking up sand attacks, but that won't be the case with Starmie. Despite how easy that fight might be right now for Starmie, I want to make it even easier. I can do that by facing Misty, defeating her, and earning myself the TM for Bubble Beam.
There are three factors in this fight that give my Starmie a significant advantage. The first one is that I know Harden, so I can set up my defense so that Misty is doing very little damage, because she has AI modification 3, meaning she is never going to use water type moves. Instead, the Staryu is only going to use Tackle, or she'll use an X Defend on it, and then the Starmie is going to use Tackle or Harden, or again get an X Defend. The third advantage is the fact that my Starmie has Bide. I can use this to accumulate damage and potentially bypass all of her stat alterations. This is really good if she gets very set up using Harden and X Defends. In this first fight, I don't get particularly good luck. The Staryu does decent damage to me. Against the Starmie, I go for Bide right away, but it's faster, so it hits a critical hit tackle before I start accumulating damage, and as a result, I don't pay very much back to it, despite it critting again, and as a result, Misty is able to defeat me. Despite it maybe being the advisable play to level up a little bit more and fight her at a higher level, I could just fight the rival and some trainers on Nugget Bridge after all. I'm going to talk about that later in the video. For now, this is my first playthrough, so I am really just feeling things out, and as a result, I continue fighting Misty, taking an easy victory over her in my next attempt. This win gives me access to the TM for Bubble Beam, which of course I'm going to teach to Starmie right away in the place of Bide. Now as I head through Cerulean City and grab the rare candy, I want to mention that you may have noticed I said my first playthrough with Starmie. I am going to count this as my first playthrough. I have already technically done a Starmie solo run. If you've been a fan of the channel for a long time, you will know that Starmie vs Cloyster was my very first versus video ever. That being said though, I don't remember the playthrough at all, so this really does feel like a fresh first playthrough. All I remembered from that video was the fact that Starmie had a fantastic move pool. So for the rest of the video, I will keep referring to this playthrough with Starmie as my first run with it, just for ease of comprehension and for simpler comparisons with Tentacruel's first run, which I am doing for the first time in this video. With Bubble Beam, I am able to easily defeat the rival. I two-shot the Spiro, one-shot the Sandshrew and Radita, and two-shot the Eevee. Access to Bubble Beam really speeds up Nugget Bridge. I grab the TM for Thunder Wave. Maybe this will be useful later on. It's good to have it. I can always sell it for money later on if I don't end up using it. I easily defeat the Oddish Trainer at the end of the route. After all, Starmie does have a normal type move. I rescue Bill, defeat the Rocket, earning myself the TM for Dig, and then I head to the SSN. In order to ensure that I'm playing safe, I am going to grab the TM for Rest. And it's here that I need to mention something about Starmie, which is not the case for Tentacruel. Due to the fact that Starmie is a stone evolution, it loses out on all the level up moves that Staryu has access to. I'm going to put on screen Staryu's Generation 1 level up learn set. In this case, beyond what Starmie gets access to, it would also learn Recover, Swift, Minimize, Light Screen, and Hydro Pump. Of course, in my standard rules, which are in the description by the way, Minimize is banned. Starmie does gain access to Swift through TM, so that one isn't really a Staryu exclusive. Light Screen is not really useful in solo challenges. It's had some niche purposes. I remember using it with Mr. Mime, but outside of that, it's not particularly good. Hydro Pump only has 80% accuracy, so Surf is better, but I think the move that I'm going to be really sad that Starmie misses out on is Recover. Of course, this is a better recovery move than Rest, but I won't have access to it today because I'm starting Fully Evolved. I do realize that the lack of Recover has the potential to disadvantage Starmie. That being said, I think starting as a Staryu and gaining access access to recovery would disadvantage it even more, because Staryu only starts with Tackle until level 17, and it's a slow growth rate Pokemon, so the Brock split would be like 10 minutes. I hope you now see that Starmie has its best chance starting fully evolved, so let's proceed. I'm going to face the rival on the SSN. This fight is very easy. I one-shot everything with Bubble Beam, even the Eevee, due to a critical hit. With him defeated, I had to make the quick choice. Do I backtrack to Cerulean City and skip Surge altogether, coming back to him after I've reached Celadon City, or am I going to face him now? I'll just remind you all now that his gym is filled with trash cans, and thematically he is also trash, so I'm going to face him now. In Pokemon Yellow, he only has one team member, Raichu. This is to make the game feel similar to the anime. There's another factor that makes the game feel similar to the anime, which is the fact that the developers removed his AI modification 3, meaning he is just randomly picking moves. It always seemed like Ash won battles just because of ridiculous misplays or some active god that couldn't be accounted for. Or perhaps agility working like double team. Anyways, let's move on. In this case, Surge shows us why he is so bad. He uses Growl twice against Starmie, lowering my attack, which is obviously useless. I'm using Bubble Beam. However, it isn't doing that much damage, so the Raichu does get a Thunderbolt in, which does so much to Starmie. After all, I am only level 23. 
However, the starfish survives on three hit points and finishes the battle with a stylish critical hit. Starmie earns itself a surge split of 16 minutes and 26 seconds. Let's see if Tentacruel is going to be able to beat that. Mirroring Starmie's approach to teach Tentacruel bide right away, then I clear out the trainers on Route 3, taking the exact same battles that I did with Starmie. So that's fighting the last. I just have to walk back to Pewter City to reset her position. This is usually slightly faster than the bug catcher. Here you'll notice that I actually ran out of PP fighting her on wrap. It's a bit annoying, I didn't really want to use acid against the Nidoran, so I just go for Bide, figuring it'll be faster, and it is in fact. Then inside of Mount Moon, I can go just over to the left and pick up TM-12, which is Water Gun. This is going to be Tentacruel's first special move. And even after Brock's 12.5% badge boost, bringing Tentacruel's attack stat up to 29, it still has way more special. Right now it's 38. In Mount Moon, I fight the same optional trainers that Starmie did, defeat the mandatory trainers, and head into Cerulean City. Here, of course, I'm going to take the same approach. So first, defeat Misty to gain access to Bubble Beam, and then use that to sweep my way through Nugget Bridge. For Misty, Tentacruel actually has a different approach. Instead of using Bide on the Staryu, it can use Wrap to knock it out without taking any damage. That being said, I just went for the Bide strategy. I thought it was going to be faster than using Wrap. After all, if you played these games as a kid, you will know that Wrap is frustratingly slow. In the end, I end up paying for this because the Starmie deals a lot of damage to me before I knock it out, and then I don't have enough health to go for Bide against the Starmie. I wanted to take it out with Acid, getting defense drops, but in the end it's just too much and Tentacruel gets its first reset here as well. In the next fight, I take the safer approach using Wrap to knock the Staryu out. This allows me to arrive at the Starmie with green health. Because I have so much health, I figured that using Bide would be faster and safer, but once again this move kind of lets me down. I take the Starmie to orange health, then it crits, and I was already going for Bide, so I have to use this again. Starmie goes for Harden twice, and then tackles once, which gives me a little bit more damage, but both of us are left on red health. Do remember that Misty's Starmie is faster. It moves first, hitting Tackle, taking Tentacruel down to two hit points. Acid hits, but it does not knock the Starmie out, and then I get lucky because Starmie goes for Harden, and I'm able to win. We're going to go through the next section of the game very quickly because we saw already that Starmie had no problems here, and Tentacruel has more special plus Bubble Beam, so yeah, it's just going to sweep everyone. In the SSN, of course, I pick up Rest in order to be safe, I defeat the rival, and then I head into the Vermilion City Gym to face Surge. There is a notable difference between these two Pokémon in this battle. With Starmie, I was faster than the Raichu, but with Tentacruel, I am not. Tentacruel is doing more damage to the Raichu, but that doesn't really change the outcome. It is like Starmie going to take four turns to knock it out. Another difference is the fact that Tentacruel has a lower defense stat, meaning every time Surge goes for a move like Mega Punch or Mega Kick, especially Mega Kick, they do a lot of damage. Tentacruel uses Bubble Beam, taking Raichu down to red health. I was really hoping for a speed drop there so I could move first, but I don't get it. Okay, Surge, please drop the ball. In this case, he goes for Mega Kick, it misses, and Tentacruel wins. This victory earns it a 17 minute surge split. If we take all the results so far and put them side by side, Tentacruel was behind by a minute and 9 seconds coming out of the Brock split. Then at Misty it gained some time, there's only 42 seconds separating the two playthroughs, and finally at Surge it has still gained time. It is now only 34 seconds behind Starmie. This race is surprisingly close. Honestly, I did not think that Tentacruel was going to have this easy of a time in the early game, especially against Brock. I'm so happy that it's putting up a competitive showing right now, and it's going to continue excelling against all of the trainers along the next route. First is the Wrapping Lass. Ordinarily she's annoying because she paralyzes you and then wraps you to death. In this case, I went for Acid on the Oddish. This is the wrong choice. I really should have wrapped it down and then knocked it out with Acid, just so that I could prevent it from using Stun Spore. However, against the Bellsprout, I can use Acid easily. Then on the second Oddish, I could take the same safer approach, but in this case, I'm so close to the end of the battle that I just went for Acid, finishing it off, and with that, I have defeated her. Next inside of Rock Tunnel is the Pokemaniac. He is a Cubone and a Slowpoke. Both of them have super effective damage against Poison types. Also, the Pokemaniac Trainer class has AI Modification 3, so he is going to be using these moves against Tentacruel. That being said, Bubble Beam just one-shots the Cubone, and then obviously I am faster than the Slowpoke, so if I really wanted, I could wrap it down. In this case, I just went for the faster knockout using Acid four times. The Status Condition Junior Trainer is next. She gets a little bit annoying using Sleep, which lasts forever against Tentacruel. She whittles it down using Absorb, but eventually I win anyways. 
Of course, no problems against the self-destructing hiker or the gambler before Celadon City, so Tentacruel is arriving here just after 21 minutes. When I'm doing my playthroughs, this is where I consider the mid-game to have started. I make this distinction largely because it feels like the game fundamentally changes. Most Pokemon gain access to at least one very useful TM at this point in the run. And for Tentacruel, that TM is Ice Beam, which I teach in the place of Water Gun. In the department store, I buy three calcium, boosting its special stat, and then I figure that Tentacruel might be strong enough now to face the trainers in Erica's gym. I defeat all of them to gain as much experience as is possible. Yes, these battles were easy. Tentacruel is so great. With them defeated, I figured that it was time to try my luck against Erica. Up first is Tangela. Okay, I forgot to heal for this fight. <laughs> bit annoying. Anyways, Ice Beam does massive damage and Mega Drain doesn't do that much because it's only neutral against Tentacruel. I finish her lead off on the next turn and move on to the Weepin' Bell. Ice Beam does a lot of damage here, however it paralyzes me, which is really annoying. Then it crits with Razor Leaf before I knock it out and move on to the Gloom. It moves first, hitting Petal Dance, which gets a crit and takes Tentacruel down to one hit point. I prayed that Ice Beam would do enough damage here, but unfortunately it doesn't, so I get a reset. I tried again, this time using Wrap against the Weeping Bell, but I miss first turn and get paralyzed, so yeah, that's a second loss. However, in the third fight, I am successfully able to wrap the Weeping Bell down, use Ice Beam to knock it out, and move on to the Gloom. I repeat the approach here with success, and so Tentacruel has defeated Erica. It gets a split of 26 minutes and 13 seconds. Now, let's go back to Starmie's footage and see how it does after Surge. The Wrapping Lass is the next trainer, and Starmie really doesn't have anything against her grass types. And that's a bad sign for the next section of the game, because there are many grass type specialists. For Starmie against the Wrapping Lass, I go for Tackle, and it does a third to her Oddish. It immediately paralyzes me, and now, this is the worst case scenario. While Tackle is going to knock her first Pokemon out, when the Bellsprout comes out is when there's potential for things to get really bad. On turn one, the Bellsprout goes for growth. This triggers a glitch, you will notice that my Starmie's speed was cut all the way down to 4. Yeah, Generation 1 is weird. When the opponent uses a move that modifies its stats, it reapplies the Paralysis debuff to the opposing Pokémon. By the time the Bellsprout has gone for a second growth, my speed is cut all the way to 1, so I'm as slow as is possible here, and then the Bellsprout starts to wrap. If you watch my live streams, you'll know that I usually reset as soon as I get paralyzed during this fight, especially against the first Oddish. I didn't do that here, I thought that maybe Starmie could squeeze out a win. It chains wrap, teases me a little bit by using growth when Starmie is on one hit point. It does it three times in a row, my attacks are prevented twice with paralysis, and I do get one tackle in, but in the end it's not enough, and the Bellsprout takes Starmie down. I tried again, and once more the first Oddish stuns Spores Starmie, and then I take a lot of damage, and the second Oddish finishes me off. Starmie performed worse in the second battle than it did in the first one. That is a regression of results. And this trend continues, because in the third fight, the first Oddish poisons me. Ordinarily, this is very desirable for me, because then my speed is not cut and I can knock out the Bell Sprouts. But because the Oddish is using Absorb and healing some health, and Tackle is dealing so little damage to it, my Starmie is quite bruised by the time the first Bell Sprout comes out. And because Tackle cannot one-shot, Wrap and Poison combo together to deal a lot of damage to Starmie each turn. Three resets to the Wrapping Last does not feel very good. Of all of the early game trainers, this is the first wall for Starmie. Instead of continuing to try to luck through this fight, there are two potential options. Number one is to go and train, and number two is to use Harden for badge boost. In the moment, I decided to go for the training option. After all, there are a lot of rock types on the former routes that I can fight now for some quick experience. That brings Starmie up to level 25, and I head back to face the Wrapping Lass over a damage rounding threshold. I get lucky. Starmie's high critical hit rate comes through for me in the first battle, taking the Oddish under half health in a single turn. It misses Poison Powder, I get a second crit, and it goes down. Next is Bellsprout. I get a third critical hit in a row, taking it to orange health, and finish it without it doing any damage. Can I please just get by the next Oddish without Stun Spore? And the crit comes through for a fourth time in the battle, taking the Oddish under half health, it uses Absorb, and I finish it off. With some incredible luck, I am able to defeat the Wrapping Lass and proceed with Starmie's playthrough. 
The nightmarish grass type Pokemon are not done yet because inside of Rock Tunnel is the status condition junior trainer. I'm using Bubble Beam against the Oddish. Yes, this is the move that does the most damage, and no, it does not do very much damage, allowing the Oddish to put Starmie to sleep, which can be very annoying, but I wake up fairly soon. However, my health is only just above half, and Oddish puts me back to sleep because there's no way I can knock it out quickly. This time the status condition lasts way too long, and Starmie faints. Yeah, that is another reset for Starmie this early into the playthrough. I have to say this is not feeling very good. Imagine if Starmie had a starting move of Swift. That would make things a lot easier in these situations against grass types. Now there's something really frustrating about this reset, which is the fact that I had formerly saved before the wrapping lasts. A lot of you are going to be angry with me about this. You're going to say, hey Scott, you should have known. But honestly, the status condition junior trainer is usually not that good, especially when you're using a fully evolved Pokemon. I figured she would be annoying, maybe putting me to sleep once or poisoning me or something like that, but Starmie would make it through the fight. That apparently was an error in judgment, so now I need to beat the wrapping lass again. This time on a second round, Starmie doesn't have problems, so I defeat her. Back at the status condition junior trainer, I want to cover the topic of blackouts. Yes, I could have blacked out against her before, but I'm pretty trained into just resetting blindly. It's how I've done my playthroughs for so long. I am trying to change this, and in 2024, we will have a blackout metric so that we can track these, and hopefully it will bring this strategy into my awareness so that I waste less time. In this case, I make it past the Oddish without any status conditions, and if that happens, this fight is usually a win. The Bulbasaur does not really have any good moves. It knows Vine Whip and Leech Seed can be a bit annoying, but in this case, they're not, and Starmie wins. But don't worry, the grass types are not done yet. The final junior trainer in the entire cave of course has an Oddish. And what moves does it know? Well, Poison Powder, Stun Spore, and Sleep Powder. The last one of course is the worst and that's the one it chooses. So it's able to take Starmie under half health. I have a moment here where I feel like there is hope. I use Tackle, it does less than half. Then the Oddish puts me back to sleep and uses Absorb to knock Starmie out. Yeah, this is the reality of this section of the game for Starmie quite disappointing. I'm happy though in this situation I am not the disappointment because I anticipated that this trainer could be problematic and saved before her. In the next fight I want to cover an alternative strategy which would be using Harden to badge boost your attack and then do more damage with Tackle to this grass type specifically. In this case that doesn't work because the Meowth knows Growl, so if I am Hardening to badge boost and the Meowth growls me once, all of my badge boosts are gone and reset, and my attack stat is recalculated with the minus one stage modifier. What that means is I have to just get lucky against the Oddish, and no, I do not get lucky this time. It puts me back to sleep, starts using Absorb again. This feels so hopeless as it drains Starmie's health. Okay, please just wake up. In this case, Starmie does. I use two bubble beams and Oddish goes down. Following that is only a Pidgey, but I have Thunderbolt for this thing. So I knock it out and Starmie has cleared Rock Tunnel and made it to Celadon City. The clock is approaching 27 minutes, and that means that Starmie is arriving in Celadon City around the time Tentacruel was defeating Erika. I think a lot of people, myself included, would have thought that these Pokemon would be very imbalanced with Starmie being significantly better. That being said, in the early game it seems that Tentacruel is actually the superior option despite Starmie's advantages against Brock. I made the decision not to get the rare candy from the hideout today to save Starmie some time. As a result in the department store I only have enough money to buy two calciums. After obtaining Fly, things are going to get much better for Starmie because there are some major moveset upgrades. I travel to Saffron City where I pick up the TM for Psychic, which I am going to teach to Starmie right away in the place of Tackle. I also teach Ice Beam in the place of Bubble Beam. You might think that that's a little bit weird, but I can rely on Psychic for now as the same type attack bonus move. It is far better in this section of the game. The battle against the rival in Pokemon Tower is simple as you would expect, which is so refreshing after the last section of the game. I finish all of his Pokemon with the exception of the Eevee in a single hit. It just gets a potion though, so it doesn't do any damage, and I knock it out. Skipping the remaining battles in Pokemon Tower because Psychic trivializes them, I head out onto Cycling Road. I'm not going to do any optional training here, so I just pick up items, the rare candy, the PP up, and then I head into the Safari Zone where I grab a Carbos, Protein, the Gold Teeth, and then the HM for Surf. Now I've said before in my videos and my live streams that sometimes teaching a water type surf is not a good idea, and because of that I am not going to teach it to Starmie right away in this first playthrough. In generation 1 there is no move deleter, so if you're using surf you can never get rid of it. 
The reason I tend to not like to use water type moves is because they don't have a lot of utility against the league, whereas psychic, ice, and electric moves are much more useful, and I want to keep Harden around just in case I need badge boost. Because I have Ice Beam on my set, I go to the Celadon gym next. Because this first playthrough was filmed quite a while ago, I do the unoptimal training by fighting all of the grass type trainers here for experience. I'll talk about the experience optimization I did in this section of the game later on in the video. For now, let's see how Starmie does against Erica. If the past is any indication, this should be fairly difficult. Her lead is Tangela, and it's quite defensive, and it has a great special stat. I go for Ice Beam, it does more than half, and freezes? Okay, that's a good start. This time Starmie is the one dishing out the status conditions. Next is Weepin' Bell. Because it's part poison type, I can use Psychic on it for massive damage, and it goes down to a single hit. By doing this, I have avoided all of its annoying status conditions. Last is Gloom, and Psychic also one-hits it. Finally, at long last, Starmie has the coverage it needs to defeat grass types. It gets an Erica split of 34 minutes and 40 seconds. After Lieutenant Surge, it was 34 seconds ahead of Tentacruel, and now it is 7 minutes and 49 seconds behind. If you've watched my videos before, this is going to feel like a completely insurmountable amount of time. And yes, I'll level with you, things are looking very bad for Starmie me right now. However, its moveset is fantastic and it has good stats, so I anticipate that the next section of the game is going to be fairly easy for it. Against Koga, it technically has a type advantage and a type disadvantage. This gym is very weird. I can one-shot all of the Venonats using Psychic. Then because of my slow growth rate, I have not leveled up enough to move first against the Venomoth, and it does have super effective damage in the form of Leech Life. This does about a fifth, my Psychic hits doing less than half. Alright, if it Leech Life's again, I'm not going to KO it on the next turn, which is a bit annoying, but Koga just uses his X attack, and I knock the Venomoth out, earning myself the fifth badge and a boost to my speed stat. Surf is now available to me outside of battle, so I'm going to head to Cinnabar Island, where I can explore the mansion and collect vitamins. While we watch this footage, you're going to see that I am running into wild Pokemon, and you're going to think that this is weird, aren't you using a Repel? But Pokemon that are equal to or higher than your lead Pokemon's level will still be able to cause battles with you. By the way, Speedrunner 0218 brought something to my attention that I find incredibly interesting. If you watch the memory addresses where the battle information is stored in these games while you're walking around with a rappel on, that area is populated with wild Pokemon data. However, the battle is never started if the rappel is successful. In general, though, I don't recommend doing this because what if you run into a really good Pokemon, say with perfect DVs or something like that, and then you're like, no, I didn't encounter it. Yeah, it would be pretty frustrating. Now, in my second playthroughs, I turn off encounters in in certain locations of the game, for example Route 1 and Mount Moon. It's a fair question to ask if Cinnabar Mansion would be another candidate for this approach to making the results more comparable. And in my opinion, that's not the case. Because Pokemon with slow growth rates sometimes cannot level enough to avoid the encounters here with repels, it feels related to the solo Pokemon that I am currently playing to leave the encounters on here. Whereas in Mount Moon, the encounters are completely unrelated to your Pokemon, there are no repels available by that point in the game, so it's basically just pure RNG, which has no relation to the Pokemon you're using. On the bottom floor of the mansion, I pick up TM14, which is Blizzard. This can be useful later on if I decide to forget Ice Beam, and then I want an Ice Move for Lance. At the very end of this area, there are two rare candies, and with them, I dig out and head to Sylph. I only fight one optional trainer here, the Machoke guy, so that I can gain access to the rare candy. Following that, I go up against the rival. I'm attempting this without rare candies, I would like to save them if possible. First is Sandslash, I crit it with Ice Beam, taking it down in one turn. Next is Cloister, which obviously goes down to a Thunderbolt. Okay, Magneton time. This is the one I'm scared for. It's probably going to be a three hit. Psychic does what looks like half. It hits Thundershock for a good amount. As I predicted, my next Psychic does not take it out, so it gets one more hit in before it faints. Next is Kadabra, which could be annoying using Recover or perhaps Disable. Even Confusion or Psybeam could be bad if they inflict the status condition, but luckily it just misses Disable and then I crit on turn two. Flareon's next, I wish I had a water type move here. Still, I don't think it would one hit just because I'm under leveled. Psyche does a third, Flareon lowers my accuracy, I miss, and it uses Bite twice, knocking Starmie out. Alright, I tried to save the rare candies, let's use them now. I'm going to use 5 to bring Starmie up to level 40 and then try again. By using these rare candies, I am going to two-shot the Magneton, but that still gives it enough time to paralyze me and get a second Thundershock in. This is why I hate this thing. Next is Kadabra. This thing wastes my time using Recover a bunch, and then it attacks, confusing Starmie, of course. I hit myself, and eventually end up with one hit point remaining before the final Flareon. 
With my speed cut, its sand attacks me right away, and Starmie gets another reset. This is not feeling very good. I expected Starmie to be a little bit better than this. The chance that the Magneton gets another paralysis is very low. It doesn't in the next fight. Because of this, I am able to defeat the Kadabra, also with a helpful critical hit, and I move on to the Flareon with green health. While it does use Sand Attack, this time it misses, and I finish it with two uses of Psychic. That concludes the Sylph portion of the game. Staying in Saffron City, I get the TM from Mimic from Copycat. After that, I go to the gym to face Sabrina. As we watch this fight, I just want to mention that this was completely inadvisable. I think facing Blaine makes way more sense next. Even if I don't want to teach Surf, Psychic is pretty good against his Pokemon because it can cause a special drop. Against Sabrina, I'm relying on Ice Beam as well as Thunderbolt, and I'm going to have my Accuracy lowered because I'm not one-shotting any of her Pokemon. Making matters even worse is the fact that I could have taught Starmie Swift in the place of Ice Beam, then set up against the Abra with Harden for badge boosts, and used the Accuracy Bypassing move to sweep her team. This mistake gets punished, so I head to Cinnabar Island instead. It was at this point that I was realizing Starmie needs more levels, so I defeat all the trainers here to gain as many as is possible. The keen-eyed among you will have spotted the fact that I am doing the quizzes first before talking to the trainers and fighting them. In Yellow Version, you have to do the quiz first. If you talk to them, they will just have a little bit of dialogue, they won't battle you, and the door will remain closed. There is of course an exception to this, the guy who doesn't have a door. You can just talk to him and battle him right away. This training brings Starmie up to level 44, and now let's see how the fire type specialist is with this water type Pokemon. Blaine leads with nine tails. It knows Tail Whip, so I figured I could use Harden here to stack a lot of badge boosts before the rest of the fight. In retrospect, I don't think this makes a lot of sense because I'm not using physical moves and I don't yet have my special boost. That being said, having a higher physical defense is going to be advantageous against the Rapidash and the Arcanine. They both hit very hard with their physical moves. I finish off the Nine Tails with just more than half health. Rapidash comes out, it goes for takedown and gets a critical hit and Starmie only has two hit points remaining. While I do finish his second Pokemon off, the Arcanine is just going to have to spam Reflect or miss takedowns now, and it doesn't do that. Yeah, Starmie loses to the Fire-type Gym Leader. In the next fight, I do the better strategy, which is just spamming Psychic. While Starmie is able to win this time, please keep Blaine in your mind, he's gonna be relevant later on. With him out of the way, I now have a special boost, so I go back to face Sabrina. This fight ends as a loss due to an accuracy drop. The next one, though, I am able to win. Do note here that I'm being very stubborn, not teaching Swift. I really should have done that. Don't worry, I'm going to correct that mistake in the follow-up run. At the Verdian City Gym, I do no optional training, and with a level 46 Starmie, I face Giovanni. I'm at quite a level disadvantage now. I'm four lower than the Doug Trio. Luckily, I am faster, and Ice Beam gets the one hit. Next is Persian, which is level 53, but I crit it with Psychic. Okay, so far so good. Nidoqueen is next. It does not go down, and it uses Thunder, but luckily it misses, and I finish it for free. The Nidoking does have more special, but it has less HP. In this case, I think I also got a better damage roll, because I finish it in one turn with Psychic. All that remains is Rhydon. I figured that a super effective Ice Beam would knock it out. Note, the Rock-type is not weak to the Ice-type, so this is not four times damage. As a result, the Rhydon survives. Its Earthquakes hit very hard, but it just goes for Fury Attack. While it does get a 5 turn, it still hardly scratches Starmie, and I knock it out on the next turn. Starmie's split is 49 minutes and 39 seconds. For reference in my tier list, the S tier is Pokemon that get times under 45 minutes, so Starmie would have had to finish the game almost 5 minutes ago to be able to be included among those ranks. As things stand right now, I'm skeptical that it's going to be able to pull this off. It's likely going to end up in the A tier. The Giovanni split is great for comparison, so let's catch up with Tentacruel now. The rival in Pokemon Tower is easy, but we should talk about the Chandler because it doesn't have super effective damage against them. Instead, it's going to be relying on either Bubble Beam or Ice Beam. I went for Bubble Beam initially because it has the slightly higher effective power. Ghastly survives on a sliver, uses Lick. Luckily, it does not paralyze, and I knock it out. The same damage range plays out against the next Ghastly, so there is a possibility for Tentacruel to lose here, but not in this run. My next destination is Sylph. 
I skipped Cycling Road as well as the Safari Zone because I did the exact same things that I did with Starmie. Inside of Sylph, I also fight the same trainers. However, there is one key difference here, which is the fact that Tentacruel can go to the seventh floor and pick up the TM for Swords Dance. Acid is my strongest physical attack, Wrap is also physical, and it can trap opponents, and Ice Beam is great type coverage. As a result, I decide to put Swords Dance in the place of Bubble Beam. So for the second time, we have another water type Pokemon that is not going to be using Surf, at least for now. I assumed that the rival in Sylph would be fairly easy because I could set up Swords Dance, max out my attack stat, and then knock his Pokemon out. Against a Pokemon like the Sand Slash, I could take it out slowly with Wrap, as well as the following Cloyster. The Magneton, of course, would survive an Acid or an Ice Beam, so I wrap it down as well. Alright, this fight's kind of slow. Then finally against the Kadabra, I can go for Acid, and it does not one-shot due to a critical hit. And the Kadabra just really wants to be frustrating because its Psybeam gets a crit as well, and Tentacruel faints. Setting up on the Sand Slash makes very little sense. It can use Sand Attack to lower my accuracy, and then if I miss the Cloister, it can confuse me with Supersonic, and self-inflicted damage does so much due to Tentacruel's discrepancy between attack and defense. I have another loss, I train to level 35, and then use 5 rare candies to go to level 40. I still make the wrong choice setting up against the Sand Slash, but it has no consequence to the outcome of the battle because I win. I use Fly to go to Fusion city because next I want to face Koga. Tentacruel has more than enough speed to move first against all his Pokemon, so Wrap is a potential avenue to victory. The fastest way to win this fight I figured would be setting up Sword Stance and then using Wrap to knock out his Pokemon. The issue with this strategy is that the first Venonat pairs very well against Tentacruel. It knows Psychic, and it also knows Sleep Powder. Due to AI Modification 3, Koga is only going to use these two moves, and if it puts me to sleep and then spams Psychic, things get bad very quickly. I managed to get my attack set up all the way, and I figured that maybe I could win here using Acid. The problem is Tentacruel's crit rate, which happens against the second Venonat, so it hits another Psychic, taking me down to 6 health. From there, things do not get better. I crit the next Venonat, and Koga defeats me. Instead of using Sword Stance, the far more reliable play is to use Wrap to take the Venonat down to lowish health, and then use Ice Beam for the knockout. This gets me all the way to the Venomoth with full health. Tentacruel's faster, so I can trap it in Wrap and slowly defeat Koga, earning myself the fifth badge and the ability to use Surf. Using it, I can go to the mansion, collect a bunch of useful items, and then face Blaine. Remember when I said he was going to be relevant later? Yeah, not for uh, Tentacruel. Tentacruel has no problems against him in this first fight. I set up Swords Dance once, and then I sweep his team using a combination of Wrap and Acid. Conveniently digging out of his gym takes me back to Saffron City, and Tentacruel's speed is 135, meaning I'm going to move first against all of Sabrina's Pokemon. I figured for the Abra, Acid was just going to knock it out, but it survives. Luckily it misses Flash. Next is Kadabra, because it's not going to lower my accuracy by default, I go for Sword Stance, setting up once, and then I use Acid, hoping for the KO, but no, because of an X Defend, it just does more than half. Luckily, Kadabra misses Kinesis, so Tentacruel is dodging all of the threats here. I make it to the Alakazam, crit with Acid, which is going to do less than my Sword Stance boosts would have, by the way. The Alakazam uses Psychic, but Tentacruel, with its monstrous special stat, survives. I miss a wrap, Alakazam uses Reflect, it's a bit frustrating, but I'm still faster so I can chain wrap for the win. There's only one more gym leader for Tentacruel to face, and what could possibly go wrong here? Well, the Doug Trio could hit an Earthquake and do absolutely massive damage. That's a bit scary. I guess I'm just gonna have to get lucky on all the other Pokemon, but Ice Beam isn't able to one-shot the Nido Queen, so Tentacruel goes down. Okay, so don't use any moves other than Wrap against the Doug Trio until it's on low health, and then use Ice Beam to knock it out. Don't know why I used Acid last time, that's obviously a misplay. Then against the Persian, I decided to go for Acid. I thought it would be faster than using Wrap, but this lets the Persian get hits in, and it takes Tentacruel down. Okay, so on the second Pokemon, I should probably be using Wrap as well. I tried for an Ice Beam, figuring maybe I'll freeze the Persian and get a free setup, but Ice Beam Gen 1 misses. That's kind of frustrating. I try to set up, but it slashes again. Now some of you have said that Ice Beam is the new Hypnosis because I'm using it too often to try and get a freeze. Yeah, in this case I definitely am, but luckily for me, I managed to get the freeze. So I set up to full with Swords Dance, and from there the rest of his team should be easy. With a badge boost to my special, I thought that Ice Beam would one-hit the Nido Queen, but it just barely doesn't. Darn. As a result, I take some damage from Earthquake. I level up going into the Nido King that's next, and I lose my badge boost. As a result, Ice Beam does less, and Tentacruel goes down. I'm about to level up, so I'll do that before I face Giovanni again. And I'm also going to do something that I've been putting off, which is teaching Surf. I put it in the place of Ice Beam, and now I should have much more reliable damage against Giovanni's entire team. Turns out a Water-type Pokémon with a Water-type move is quite good against a Ground-type Specialist. I one-hit the Nido Queen as well as the Nido King, and of course the Rhydon. 
Unlike Starmie's earlier time delay against all of the grass types, this time delay against Giovanni is 100% player error. Tentacruel's split of 47 minutes and 1 second is 2 minutes and 38 seconds ahead of Starmie. That's still a decent lead, and I expect both of these Pokemon to have some problems during the league. Before that I have to defeat the rival, I try setting up on the Sand Slash. It's doing a lot of damage, so before I complete my setup, I have to knock it out with Surf. I use Acid to one-shot the Execute, and then Wrap to chip away at the Cloister before using Surf to hopefully knock it out. It survives, misses Supersonic, and goes down anyways. Alright Magneton, please do not paralyze me. I go for Surf, it does more than half, Magneton uses Thundershock, Tentacruel survives, and I finish it. Acid 1 hits the following Kadabra, and Flareon obviously is not a problem for Tentacruel, unless I make a silly player error and use something like Acid. In the end, it doesn't matter, the Flareon's really bad, it just uses Leer, and I've won. How will Starmie do in this fight? Overall, I think it is much more capable here with its current moveset. Ice Beam is good against both the Sand Slash as well as the Execute, Thunderbolt is great against the Cloister, nothing is good against the Magneton, as is usually the case but it doesn't paralyze, and I move on to the Kadabra. Things slow down here because I have to use Ice Beam or Thunderbolt to knock it out, but I make it to the Flareon, I use Psychic, it just goes for Smog, which poisons me and I'm only doing about a third, so I do take some poison damage. Because of my typing, it's only choosing between Smog or Leer, so Starmie has one. Going into the league, Tentacruel has an advantage of 2 minutes and 33 seconds. Will it be able to surprise us and defeat Starmie? Let's find out. Both of these water type Pokemon don't have particularly good matchups against Lorelei. Theoretically, things should be slightly harder for Tentacruel because of its secondary poison typing. This makes the Slowbro specifically hit harder with Psychic. I use the word theoretically very intentionally because Tentacruel doesn't actually have a problem here. It can just set up Swords Dance against the Dugong and then use Wrap to knock out any of the Pokemon it's worried about. For example, I can wrap down the Cloister to low HP and then use Surf to finish it off. The issue here is just missing Wrap or maybe miscalculating a damage range like I do against the Slowbro using Acid too soon. That being said, it takes Slowbro to low health, and Lorelei uses a Super Potion anyways, so I finish it for free. Acid easily one-hits the Jinx, which is the other Psychic type, but it doesn't know any Psychic type moves anyways. All that's left is Lapras. I can use Wrap here to bring it down to low health and polish it off. Okay, so it is the trainer that we don't speak about next. He got lucky in the last Versus video that I made, but in this one, he is not going to get lucky. Tentacruel has Surf, and it one-shots all of his Pokémon except the Machamp. And what does it do when it survives? It goes for Leer. Well played. Things are not going to continue being this easy for Tentacruel though, because Agatha is next. With my current moveset, I can't drop Surf, I really do not want to give up Swords Dance, and I figured that I needed to keep both Acid and Wrath. In order to be successful here, I have to set up with Swords Dance, badge boosting my special stat, so that I can use Surf to deal as much damage as possible to Agatha's Pokémon. As the first fight plays out, I was really surprised how far I got while paralyzed. I managed to knock out her Arbok and move on to the final Gengar. In some situations, resetting when you get paralyzed at the beginning of the fight is a good idea, like with Starmie against the Wrapping Lass, but in this situation, paralysis can actually be an advantage because then the Gengar cannot use Hypnosis on you. This takes away its most powerful move, Dream Eater, and it's really left with just Psychic and Confuse Ray. That being said, Agatha does not have AI Script 3, so she can just choose Hypnosis Hypnosis and Dream Eater and do absolutely nothing. The problem that I have is a little bit different. I have run out of uses of Surf, so I have to use Acid to knock the Gengar out. Even with Swords Dance set up, it's not doing that much. And eventually, I hit myself doing massive damage, and Gengar finishes me with Psychic. Well, how much worse could it be? Um, I could reset against the Arbok when it uses Wrap against Tentacruel, but then in the next battle I make it back to the Gengar with significantly more health. Surf does almost half, I have way more PP this time, it confuses me, I hit myself, it's a bit annoying, I hit myself again. This self-inflicted damage isn't doing as much though because I didn't set up Swords Dance at all. Problem is, when you hit yourself you don't get to attack, so without dealing damage to the Gengar, I am not going to win. Giving it time to use Psychic, Tentacruel hits itself one more time, and Agatha wins again. I do have rare candies in my bag, but I was being a bit stubborn not using them. I am also being stubborn not teaching another move like Blizzard, for example. I hope it's obvious to all of you that I can drop acid at this point in the run, it's just not useful on my set. Wrap fills the niche of physical move for Tentacruel quite well. I say all that because I think it could have prevented some resets here if I had been a higher level. Still, I do manage to defeat her with this strategy, and it is a close fight. Her final Gengar comes out, it confuses Tentacruel, Paralysis prevents a move, Gengar tries Dream Eater, that's not gonna 
work, obviously. I snap out of confusion. It uses Psychic, and my Tentacruel survives on four hit points. The Gengar is still on full health. I go for Surf. In this case, it does just less than half. Gengar tries Dream Eater again, and then Surf crits for the knockout. The next footage is going to show you where my mind was at when I was doing this run. I delete Wrap in favor of having Blizzard to go up against Lance. This is objectively a very bad choice. I really should not have done this. Because I did, now my primary damage against the Gyarados is either going to be Acid boosted with Swords Dance or Blizzard, which is quite inaccurate, and I need to save PP for the rest of the Pokemon. Trying to use Acid would have worked if I didn't get a critical hit, but because of one I get my first loss. At long last I realized that Acid is not the right choice, so we teach Mimic in its place. This allows me to do a really fun strategy against Lance where I can set up with Swords Dance against the Gyarados, and then Mimic Hyper Beam for massive damage, which is great against targets that take neutral damage from ice moves. After fully setting up, I knock the Gyarados out with a single Hyper Beam, and then I use Blizzard against the Dragonairs. Despite missing, the first one doesn't paralyze me, so it isn't an issue. The second one goes down for free. Aerodactyl comes out, it outspeeds by 11 speed, hits Hyper Beam, and does so much damage, that's because my defense was dropped by the Gyarados. But Tentacruel survives on 7 hit points and Surf knocks it out. All that's left is Dragonite and Blizzard easily one-shots. With a lance split of 56 minutes and 55 seconds, Tentacruel is now ready to face the champion. But how will Starmie do during the league? Overall, its typing is much better for this section of the game. Tentacruel was weak against Lorelei's Slowbro, but Starmie has no weaknesses here. Plus, at long last, Harden will be used. Useful, I can take my time setting up on the Dugong and then use Thunderbolt to knock it out. The following Cloister has low special, so it's also a one hit, and then Slowbro comes in. It's gonna survive, but what is it going to do? I resist both of its attacking moves. That's not the case for the following Jinx. It has neutral damage and it also knows Lovely Kiss, and after managing to survive, it puts Starmie to sleep, but I wake up right away. It's doing pathetic damage with Thrash. I basically resist this move after setting up my defense stat. I knock it out, move on to the Lapras, it paralyzes Starmie, and then Body Slam gets a critical hit, Starmie can't move, and Lapras knocks me out with Body Slam. Okay, so that was unlucky. Let's use two rare candies just to make the odds a little bit better and try again. I make it back to the Lapras, this time on orange health. Note that I have set up my defense stat even more. I want to take as little damage as is possible from Body Slam. Plus in the last fight, I leveled up going into the Jinx, meaning I lost my badge boosts. Still having them against the Lapras is really helpful for damage. I still just barely don't have enough to knock it out, but this triggers Lorelei to use a super potion and I finish it on the next turn. Starmie's really good against the next guy, by the way. The Machamp doesn't even survive. If that's the case, there are never going to be problems here. And Starmie is really good against Agatha as well. Despite the fact that the ghost type is supposed to be the psychic type's counter, yeah, in Gen 1 they messed that up with a programming error, so psychic types are immune to ghost type attacks, and her most scary moves are psychic anyways, so I resist them. No problems at all. Next is Lance, and as you would expect, this one is also going to be easy. Thunderbolt one hits the Gyarados, Ice Beam takes down both of the Dragonairs, the Aerodactyl does survive an Ice Beam, Kind of annoying, I have to tank a Hyper Beam as a result, and then I move on to the Dragonite. Important context here, my Starmie is level 53, and the Dragonite is level 62. Ice Beam does not get the one hit. Lance uses a Hyper Potion, I get to roll my damage again, and the Dragonite survives. This allows it to use Thunder and knock Starmie out. Okay, I wasn't expecting that. I was pretty sure that I was just going to knock the Dragonite out right away. There's an easy solution to this. I can just teach Blizzard in the place of Ice Beam. After all, in Generation 1, it has 90% accuracy. Let's try that fight again. This time, the Gyarados survives Thunderbolt. Yeah, the Gyarados survived the Thunderbolt. The Gyarados isn't even that high of a level. Because of that, I take half damage from a Hyper Beam before moving on to the first Dragonair, and then Blizzard misses, Dragonair Thunder Waves, uses Thunderbolt, my next Blizzard knocks it out, but the following Dragonair just uses Wrap on Starmie. I think this is giving the Starfish terrible PTSD flashbacks at this point. <laughs> Anyways, when I'm on low health, the Dragonair just uses Hyper Beam and Starmie faints again. Thing is, sometimes my damage roll against the Gyarados is good enough, and if Blizzard doesn't miss, which is what happens in this fight, then I can defeat his team. Starmie's Lance split is 57 minutes and 14 seconds. It is now 19 seconds behind Tentacruel. The gap may have been wider earlier on, but that doesn't matter now. All of the first playthrough bragging rights come down to this final fight. Up first is Sandslash. This thing's not particularly scary. I take my time here with Starmie, setting up with Harden five times before I knock it out. 
This leaves me on orange health, but I figured that would be good enough for the rest of the battle. Next is Alakazam. I use Blizzard. This is my strongest neutral damage against it. It survives and uses Psybeam, taking Starmie down to red health. While that is a little bit annoying, if I can just one hit the remaining Pokemon I should be fine. However, the Executor survives and sets up Leech Seed. I finish it off without taking any damage and move on to the Magneton, but of course it survives Psychic, goes for Thunder Wave, paralyzing Starmie. Then due to the AI, the only move it can use on the next turn is Thunderbolt, so that's a loss. The issue here was largely one that I couldn't recover my health once I made it to the Executor. I'm going to teach Rest in the place of Thunderbolt to fix this problem. This has an additional advantage of being useful against the Sandslash while I set up Harden. The only flaw in this approach is if the Sandslash crits with Earthquake, which is exactly what happens. I tried again, the Sandslash gets very annoying, critting with Slash over and over. I heal up and eventually it gets a crit with Earthquake and Starmie goes down for a third time. Eventually this does work though, I get 6 Hardens set up and then I can use Psychic for the knockout. Next is Alakazam. Blizzard is still not able to knock it out. With its one turn in battle, it goes for Psychic, luckily not lowering Starmie's special stat. With six badge boosts, Blizzard one hits the Executor, but the Magneton is not the same scenario. It survives, of course, uses Thunder Wave, paralyzes Starmie, and goes for Thunderbolt, but it is not enough to finish me off. Now in Generation 1, you can't recover your speed stat by using Rest to heal, so I will be slower than the Cloister as well as the Flareon, but I think that's okay. I can buy time with Rest because the Cloister is just spamming Spike Cannon over and over again, and the Executor wasn't able to set up Leech Seed. When I wake up, I have half health, I use Psychic, and it knocks the Ice type out. Last is Flareon. Because of its moves, it's going to spam Quick Attack, which is obviously not doing very much to a Pokemon with plus 6 defense. So that's what Starmie needed. It clocks in with a final first playthrough time of 1 hour, 2 minutes, and 11 seconds, with 17 resets at level 57. This is a game time of 3 hours and 19 minutes. I find it slightly disappointing that I wasn't able to get Starmie's time under an hour in its first playthrough, but I'll easily be able to do this in my second attempt. With how rough that champion was for Starmie, I'm sure you're expecting Tentacruel to take this now. Up first is the champion Sandslash. I wanted a powerful physical move to pair well with Swords Dance, so I'm going to mimic Earthquake. Sandslash uses this move, and from full health it one-hits Tentacruel without a critical hit. Okay, so I'm going to use my rare candies now to boost Tentacruel up from level 52 to level 56. Also, I didn't want to mess around with the Sand Slash, so I knock it out right away with Surf. This puts Tentacruel in another complex situation, though, because it is weak to Alakazam's attacks. It does have better special, though, so I'm thinking I'm going to survive. But Alakazam crits with Psybeam, doing so much. Tentacruel does hang on, with one hit point, though. It's pretty fun that I survived on one hit point, but it doesn't really matter for the fight. I still have a reset here. Okay, I need a different approach to the strategy. If I use Swords Dance on turn one, maybe I can badge boost my defense high enough to survive a hit from Earthquake. And that is the case. That means I get the attack boost to move on to the Alakazam with. This doesn't even give Blizzard a two hit range, which is disappointing. Luckily it misses Kinesis, so I finish it for free. Now while I will be able to defeat the Executor, if I have low health there is no way I can go up against the Magneton, and I'm pretty sure I need more setup in order to one hit it. After a couple more resets, I teach Tentacruel Rest in the place of Blizzard. My set is kind of weird now. I also realized that I can mimic Earthquake right away and just barely survive and then knock the Sand Slash out. Then I can use Earthquake to finish off the Alakazam, and on Executor I can heal with Rest. Because of the type interaction, it is going to choose between either Leech Seed and Hypnosis. Without it using Barrage and Stomp, I am not worried about it knocking me out while I sleep, so I can set up Swords Dance essentially for free. This does take quite some time though. If you look at the clock, we are just over one hour and one minute. That's still faster than Starmie's time, but things are getting really close. Plus, I have to knock out the Executor in the slowest way possible with Earthquake and Surf. I finally managed to do it, and then the champion sends in Magneton, but finally this thing is not a problem. I have super effective damage with Earthquake, and I can knock it out in one hit. Okay, time for the Cloister. The only way it's going to knock me out is if it gets critical hits with Spike Cannon. And guess what happens on the very first turn? Yep, a critical hit with Spike Cannon. It hits for a total of 4 turns, which is not enough to get the KO, so luckily for me, I can just use Rest and Heal Up and bide my time until it doesn't get crits. And honestly, this takes a while. If you've seen my videos before, this is a common scenario that water types get into. There isn't a fast way to knock the Cloister out. If Leech Seed is on the field because you can't one-hit the Executor, then you're going to be stuck feeding it health every turn while you're trying to rest yourself to get one more attack in. 
All the while, the cloister is just getting more and more rolls for critical hits. And in this case, while I'm asleep, it gets another crit, which hits for five turns, the maximum number, taking Tentacruel down to orange health. I don't wake up, it hits a two turn spike cannon, taking me to red. And while I do wake up on the next turn, the following spike cannon hits too many times and Tentacruel goes down. So it's officially slower than Starmie in its first playthrough. But how long is it going to take it to beat the champion? I have a solid strategy, as long as the cloister doesn't get too many critical hits, I will eventually finish it off, and the Flareon will be free because it's going to spam Reflect. Well, I don't have good news for any Tentacruel fans. It takes me a lot longer. I had some problems against the Executor, so I tried a Restless strategy, which really doesn't work. I have another reset to the Cloister. To explore more possibilities, I taught Mega Drain in the place of Mimic and Rest in the place of Swords Dance. With this set, I can use Surf to knock out the Sand Slash, then Surf to two-shot the Alakazam, and after that I can use Blizzard on the Executor. Magneton's next, it's gonna knock me out if it goes for Thunderbolt, which it does here. After this period of experimentation, I went back to the original strategy with Swords Dance, Earthquake, Rest, and Surf. It's at this time that I'm gonna fade out the champion's team and show you the move pool for Tentacruel again, because this thing learns Barrier at level 35, and I chose not to take it. My reasoning during the playthrough was that Tentacruel would overall just be faster if it is setting up its offensive stats, and if I was setting up my defensive stat, I was primarily going to be doing that for badge boosts. For that reason, I thought that Sword Stance would just give more benefits, my physical moves will hit harder, plus I will get the badge boosts that I would have gotten with Barrier anyways. But if we really think about it, Barrier solves a lot of problems against the Champion. The Sand Slash's Earthquake is no longer going to deal that much damage, and then Cloister's Spike Cannons are going to be pathetic unless they get crits. Unfortunately, there is no move reminder in Generation 1, so I am stuck with the set that I have now, I'm going to have to make it work, and eventually. At long last, I am able to knock the cloister out. This took forever. So, I've arrived at the final Flareon. As I said before, it only spams Reflect. Tentacruel knocks it out and clocks in with a final time of 1 hour 15 minutes and 16 seconds, with 27 resets at level 57. This is a game time of 3 hours and 30 minutes. Comparing these final results, Starmie was so much faster, 13 minutes and 5 seconds. That being said, this is a first playthrough, and obviously I just chose the wrong strategy with Tentacruel. Reflecting on the entire playthrough, if I had even given up Acid to have access to Barrier, I think things would have been easier. Holding onto Acid for far too long was definitely a mistake. Now while Tentacruel's result is particularly disappointing, both of them did not get sub-hour times, and I thought they were both destined for that, after all they have incredible stats. I definitely know in second playthroughs they will both achieve that, so let's talk about the data that this first playthrough gave me, which is the starting point for my optimization process. Throughout these runs I tried to not over battle trainers and do everything on the minimum possible battles, that is likely why my real time and resets were so high for both of these playthroughs. If we chart game time against trainers, we can see that both Pokemon are actually very close to each other throughout the entire game. Starmie has an advantage in the early game, and then Tentacruel gets an advantage throughout the mid game. Interestingly enough, by the time they reached Giovanni and Rival 6, both were very close to each other, and then at the very end of the game the results just slightly diverged, largely because because Starmie is one-hitting most things with powerful moves that are super effective, whereas Tentacruel is taking time to set up and use Wrap to defeat trainers like Lorelei. Looking at the splits chart shows us just how close these two were to each other after they finished Lance, and just how much harder the champion was for Tentacruel. Now if you're a Tentacruel fan and you're very disappointed in my play and angrily writing in the comments, please take one moment right now to just think about what you're doing. It's gonna hurt my feelings. I don't want my feelings hurt. Please look at Tentacruel's Erica split. It's so much better than Starmie's. I think there still is hope for the tentacle monster to dominate here. Uh, as I'm recording this, I'm realizing that maybe that is not the right way to phrase that. Anyways, let's just move on from that statement and see how Starmie does with optimizations. For this section of the video, I have to give a huge shout out to Austin who helped me optimize both Starmie and Tentacruel. If you don't know who he is, he participated in the Smeargle race, and he is a fantastic solo runner, far more talented than I am. Thank you so much, Austin. Our discussion started talking about fights like Rival 5, Koga, and briefly the Champion. Then we also talked about Blaine, who is surprisingly a problem for Starmie. After gathering a bunch of information, I went in and did another playthrough, and I discovered that Misty can be really awful. 
The thought process for me seemed obvious. Fight her right away with a move like Bide and use Harden to take less damage from her Pokemon. Then once I defeat her I get Bubble Beam and I speed through the entire next section of the game. While that sounds really good, it ends up not being the correct approach. While fighting Brock on minimum battles certainly feels good, it does not make sense for Starmie. I want the fast experience from the junior trainer just in front of him to level up. At level 8, Starmie can move first against both of Brock's Pokemon, so I don't need to heal for this battle, I can just defeat him easily. Beyond that, on Route 3 I fight minimum Pokemon, and then in Mount Moon I fight two optional trainers, the Super Nerd as well as the Hiker. This brings Starmie to level 15 by the time I'm entering Cerulean City, and now instead of fighting Misty, I am going to fight the rival. With a lot of Pokemon, it's easy to be scared of him because he has Growl on his first Spearow as well as Sand Attack on the Sand Troop. But access to a Water Move, which deals special damage, counters both of these Pokemon's most intimidating strategies, and so I'm reliably going to be able to win here. The reason I've done this fight is specifically to gain access to Nugget Bridge, which has a lot of mandatory trainers. I need to clear them out at some point in the run, so I'm going to do that now and level Starmie up as much as is possible. Upon reaching the guy who gives me a Charmander, I pick up the TM for Thunder Wave and then backtrack to Cerulean City. I can use the Electric type move to cut Goldeen's consistency inside of Misty's gym. Yes, the Goldeen is sometimes problematic for Starmie. So yeah, Goldeen, a tricky Pokemon, but don't worry, Thunder Wave is not just useful against it. Against Misty, I want to set up to plus 6 defense so that her normal type moves are dealing as little damage as is possible to my Starmie. Using Thunder Wave, I can cut her star use consistency with Tackle, meaning it's going to do less damage to me throughout its time in the battle. Notably here, I have Brock's badge, so as I'm setting up Harden, I am also badge boosting my attack stat. When Starmie comes out, I paralyze it right away to ensure that I outspeed every turn, and then I use Tackle to knock it out. The only way this fight can go wrong is if she gets a lot of critical hits with her tackles. In this case, she gets one, but that is not enough, and my Starmie defeats her without a reset. Using the TM for Bubble Beam really speeds up the next section of Nugget Bridge, and then, as I head towards Vermilion City, we need to talk about the two upcoming trainers. Surge is not really that terrifying. While Thunderbolt is a 75% chance to one-hit, he is not going to be prioritizing this move, and it has a 53% chance to three-hit the Raichu. Also, Starmie will be faster than the Raichu once it makes it to this fight, so overall he is not really an issue. I don't think backtracking to him makes any sense. Starmie is definitely a good enough Pokemon that can just fight him right away. After all, he is like the worst gym leader in the entire game. He is so bad. When he gives me a reset, even with a first stage Pokemon, I feel slightly frustrated. All of that being said, Surge isn't the scariest trainer in this section of the game. Of course, we know, it's the Wrapping Lass. Austin made me aware of a strategy that Red Riosi came up with to fight her, which was specifically to use Hardens on the first Bellsprout to badge boost so that you can two-shot the following Oddish, and then hopefully make it to the final Bellsprout without paralysis. If the first Bellsprout paralyzes, just reset right away for consistency. Here are my damage ranges without any setup. You can see that Bubble Beam is doing more damage than Tackle against her Grass type. Types. So the first Oddish is likely going to be a 3 hit, meaning it has 2 turns to use Stun Spore. If we examine the damage ranges once I have set up 4 Hardens, now you can see that Tackle is dealing slightly more damage. On the second Oddish it has an 86% chance to 2 hit. I tried to make this strategy work, but I got a lot of frustrating results against her. In the end, I decided to opt for a completely different approach. On the SSN, I pick up Rest. I really did not want to have to use this with Starmie, but overall I think it is the best play. Then I teach this move in the place of Tackle. Remember, without setup, Bubble Beam is dealing more damage to the grass types. This lets my set be Bubble Beam, Rest, Harden, and Thunder Wave. I'm keeping Harden because I'm going to need it for setup against the Champion. Thunder Wave is useful against the Raffing Lass, which is just hilarious, and Bubble Beam of course is my go-to move throughout this section of the game. With that all set up, I am ready to face Surge. By the way, you could Thunder Wave him here, but I don't really think it's worth it. Just spam Bubble Beam and win. With him defeated, I'm now ready to take on the Raffing Lass. Teaching Thunderbolt here is a mistake, I'm going to wait until after I defeat her to do that. The strategy is simple, if her Oddish paralyzes, reset right away as I mentioned before. That's what happens here in my first attempt. In my second attempt, we can see what I want to have happen, I really want to knock out the first Oddish without getting hit by Stun Spore. It poisons me, which is very convenient, however since Starmie takes a long time to knock out her Pokemon, I can just use Rest to heal this status condition, and then proceed with the fight. Without a status condition I arrive at the second Oddish, this one can use Stun Spore on me, but there is where I want to note that Thunder Wave can be used to cut the following Bellsprout's speed in the case that I go into it paralyzed. With Rest I'll be able to heal my health on the second Oddish, and then against 
against the Bellsprout, it will eventually miss a wrap or use Growth, in which case Thunder Wave will cut its speed, and then I can move first in between all of its wraps. With this strategy, I will defeat the Wrapping Lass if I get by the first Oddish without Paralysis. And in this run, I get by her under 16 minutes. Just for comparison, when I was using the other strategy trying to set up Harden, I was usually getting by her around 16.30 to 17 minutes. That demonstrates that this saves time even with adding rest. This recovery move also helps throughout the tunnel, because like we saw before, there are a lot of grass types here, but if they're getting sketchy, I can just use rest to heal and then take a little bit more time and defeat them. Once arriving in Celadon City, I explore the hideout to grab an extra rare candy. This is going to be critical for Starmie so that I can skip many battles. In the department store, I teach Ice Beam in the place of rest. That move has served its purpose through this playthrough. Then I journey to Saffron City, grab Psychic, and teach it in the place of Bubble Beam like I did before. I want to cover the few optional trainers that Starmie fights. On Cycling Road, I fight this guy who has Wheezing, Coughing, and Wheezing. He has the best experience per second on this entire route. Then I fight the second best experience per second trainer, the guy with five Pokemon on his team. That's it. I explore the Safari Zone, head back to Erica's gym, and fight the cool trainer instead of the beauty. She gives significantly better experience, by the way. This approach to fighting key trainers in the mid game is something that I have been very focused on over the last few months, and it has improved my results in these playthroughs dramatically. With the cool trainer out of the way, you're probably wondering how consistent Erica is. Well, the Tangela is a two hit with Ice Beam, and then both the Weeping Bell and Gloom are guarantees with Psychic. The next destination is Koga's Gym. I'm going to fight the two optional Tamers in here to gain a lot of experience points, and once Starmie finishes all the battles here, it is level 35. This is the key level that gives it 104 speed if you used one Carbos when you were in the department store. With this speed, Koga is easy mode. I one shot all of the Venonats, and then against the Venomoth, I have a guaranteed two hit. It's only dealing 25 damage against me with its best possible damage range, so even though it heals, it doesn't matter. Now, the reason I did Koga first is because when I go to Sylph next, once I defeat the guy with Machoke, Starmie levels up to level 36. Clearing him gives me access to the eighth rare candy of the playthrough, and I can use all of them now to boost Starmie up to level 44. I'm doing this so all the experience lines up for the next section of the game, and to reduce the amount of training required. Also, I want to be a very high level to face Blaine, essentially the highest possible level. I can't believe that Austin and I actually spent time talking about him. We both had decided that fighting him at a lower level, like 41, was just not reliable enough, so using the candies now is going to help against him later on. Plus, using the candies now makes the rival in Sylph much easier. The first two Pokemon are one-shots, and then the final three are two shots. After finishing Sylph, I am still in Saffron City, and I'm going to go straight to Sabrina's gym. This is because I have taught Swift in the place of Ice Beam, and that is going to trivialize the fight against her. Set up with Harden, badge boost your attack. Whenever Abra uses Flash, it also badge boosts you, and then Swift bypasses the accuracy checks and defeats her for free. Giving up Ice Beam isn't a problem, because the next destination is Pokemon Mansion, where I can grab Blizzard and teach this in the place of Swift. Let's talk about Blaine. I originally rooted level 41 for this fight, which is nowhere near high enough. At level 46, it is much more consistent. Stormy has guaranteed 3 hits on all of his Pokemon, with chances for 2 hits. 40% against the Ninetales, 77% against the Rapidash, and 40% for the Arcanine. As we watch this fight play out, I just want to describe why Surf is not useful here. If I can't get rid of it, it really messes Starmie's move setup for the League. I really want Psychic for Agatha and Bruno, Blizzard of course for Lance and the Champion, and Thunderbolt for Lorelei, Lance, and the Champion. Plus, it is absolutely required for Starmie to have Harden on its set to make the Champion work with this strategy. Using Surf here means I have to drop one of these moves, and everything just falls apart as a result, giving it worse overall results. Using the 8 rare candies has put me in a place where after I defeat the mandatory trainers inside of Viridian City Gym, Starmie is going to level up to 48, and I can use 2 rare candies to boost it to level 50 before I take on Giovanni. This fight is very simple for once. If I miss Blizzard on the Dugtrio or the Rhydon, things could get bad. Dugtrio can do damage or use Sand Attack, and then Rhydon could crit with Earthquake. If it does that, Starmie is going to faint. That being said, it could also just use Horn Drill, Fury Attack, or Giovanni could use a Guard Spec. I like Starmie's odds here. Once I defeat Giovanni, I level up after his final Pokemon. Then against the rival, I also level up after his Flareon. 
Inside of Victory Road, I fight no optional trainers, opting to go into the fight against Lorelei at level 52. This one is pretty simple. Set up with Harden against the Dugong, and then sweep with Thunderbolt. The Jinx does put me to sleep, which is a bit annoying. It wastes time. In the end, I manage to emerge victorious. The next two trainers do not stand a chance when I'm a psychic type with a psychic type move. Yeah, I sweep them and move on to Lance's chamber. Here, Starmie is level 54, and I actually don't even save to fight him. I just walk straight towards his sprite, bump into him, and he immediately starts talking to me. The reason I didn't save is I am not scared about this fight at all. Thunderbolt the Gyarados, Blizzard, pretty much everything else, and it's a free win. Okay, so Starmie beats Lance. This is going to be a surprise for everyone listening in the background. It did this in a time under 40 minutes. With his slow growth rate Pokemon, this feels so good. Plus, I am beating the game at one of the lowest levels I ever have. But as you will remember, the champion was definitely the most difficult trainer for both of these water types. To make him easier, I teach Mimic in the place of Psychic. Ordinarily, I usually use the one rare candy from Victory Road right before the champion. And up until my final run, that was my strategy. The problem doing that is while it does give you one more level, then Starmie levels up going into the Flareon at the end of the battle, which is very bad bad because I lose my badge boosts and I can no longer one hit it. This gives it the opportunity to roll for critical hits with quick attack and yes I did lose battles because of this. The solution is so easy, just skip the rare candy in Victory Road, you don't need it. Without the rare candy I'm gonna level up going into the Executor, which is right before I set up, and then right after I knock out the Flareon. By the way, I love that the answer here is not to use a rare candy and be one level lower. That never seems like it would be the right choice, but in this case it is. With that important preamble out of the way, now let's talk about the strategy in the fight. Turn 1, Mimic Earthquake, and then turn 2, hit Blizzard and knock Sandslash out. I don't want to take any more damage. Next is Alakazam. I can use Earthquake to knock it out in 2 hits. If the Alakazam gets a Kinesis, reset right away to not waste time. We know that the Executor is only going to use Leech Seed because I'm a Water-type Pokemon. Because of that, I know that I can set up Harden here reliably, and I will have enough health after both the Sandslash and the Alakazam. This gives me 4 badge boosts with Harden, which is exactly the number I need, and I can knock out the Executor with 2 Blizzards. The boosts were required so they can one-shot the Magneton with Earthquake, and then things get easier. One-shot the Cloister with Thunderbolt, and one-shot the Flareon with Earthquake. Starmie clocks in with a time of 40 minutes and 49 seconds, with one reset, which was against the Wrapping Lass, at level 57. This is a game time of 2 hours and 40 minutes. Now that we have its results, let's place Starmie in my tier list. With a time under 45 minutes, it is going to get a spot in the S tier. In this case, it is faster than Haunter, Nidoqueen, Vileplume, and Nidoking, earning itself the fourth overall spot just behind Gengar. I completed a total of 7 playthroughs with Starmie, and I think if I continued to do more, I would struggle to get the time lower than this. Using the same strategy, Austin was able to achieve a result of 41 minutes and 17 seconds with Starmie, so I think this is a very reliable result for this water type. With its results in, now we need to see how Tentacruel can do. Approaching the optimization of this run after my first playthrough, I thought that Barrier was going to be the answer and I would have to give up Swords Dance. I also briefly considered running both Barrier and Swords Dance at the same time, like I did a long time ago with Tentacool. That being said, I am really lucky that I optimized Arbok just before optimizing Tentacruel, because that playthrough taught me the power of Wrap. Because Tentacruel's speed is higher than Arbox, it can solve more problems with this powerful trapping move. I don't know how until this point I have not realized that the words wrap and trap rhyme. It's like rap trap. That's essentially the strategy I'm going for with Tentacruel. With one move solving so many problems, I have three other move slots, so Tentacruel has so much more flexibility. After all, I think this is the thematic way to play Tentacruel, because it has tentacles which are very flexible. In the early game, I make a risky choice by facing the rival on Route 22. This is risky because the Spearow can defeat me by using Peck over and over and over again, or using Growl lowering Tentacruel's attack stat. That being said, if I lose, I'm just going to restart the playthrough. It's so early on, I only waste about a minute and a half. In my own attempts, I was winning more than 50% of the battles here, so it felt reliable enough. Austin had a little bit worse luck in this section of the game, but, but overall I think this is the right choice. After the Spearow goes down, the fight gets way easier because you can just wrap trap the EV. Fighting him here ensures that I'm going to be fighting the Jolteon team throughout the rest of the playthrough, and yes, this is the easier team for Tentacruel to go up against. I fight all the bug catchers in Viridian Forest, they are fast experience, and this brings Tentacruel up to level 10. With that I have the outspeed on the Onyx, and now I can trap all of his Pokémon, so this fight is simple. In Mount Moon, I fight two optional trainers just like Starmie, but they're different. 
In this case, I fight the Bug Catcher first and then the Hiker. Just like Starmie, I am going to fight the rival on Nugget Bridge first. However, I just beat him and then go right into the gym and defeat the Junior Trainer. With Tentacruel having access to Acid, I do not need to worry as much about Misty as I do with Starmie. Acid has a 33% chance to lower the opponent's defense, so as Starmie sets up with moves like Harden, I have a chance to counter that out and continue doing good damage. There's an alternative play here, which is fighting Nugget Bridge, getting enough speed, and then coming back and using Wrap to defeat Misty. I thought that overall that would be the slower approach, and there was better risk-reward just fighting Misty right away. I do get punished for that here, because Tentacruel does have one reset against Misty, but it defeats her on its second attempt. On the SSN, I only fight one optional trainer, which is the guy so I can gain access to the rare candy, and then I defeat the rival. Next is Surge, and I can't make this fight perfectly consistent, so he does give Tentacruel a reset today. Very frustrating, at least I beat him on my second attempt. Wrap fittingly is the solution for the wrapping lass. I steamroll through Rock Tunnel, and then once arriving in Celadon City, I go into the Rocket Hideout and grab a rare candy. In the department store, I use three Carbos on Tentacruel, and I also teach it Ice Beam in the place of Water Gun. Covering the optional trainers in the mid game, I fight one additional trainer on Cycling Road, this guy who has four Grimers, as well as the other two trainers that Starmie fought. The prize in the Safari Zone Surf is actually useful on Tentacruel, so I'm going to teach it in the place of Bubble Beam. Next I face Erica, and Tentacruel is not as well suited to defeat her as Starmie is. I have two hits on all three of her Pokemon. That means if I want to avoid Sleep Powder, I need to use Wrap first on both the Weeping Bell and the Gloom, and then finish them with Ice Beam. By the way, Ice Beam does between 80 and 95% damage to the Weeping Bell, and 83 and 99% damage to the Gloom, so Rap only needs to hit once against both of them. In Sylph, I fight a total of 6 trainers. This guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. This experience brings Tentacruel up to level 36, where I can use 7 rare candies to boost it all the way to 43. This major level boost makes sure that the rival in Sylph is going to be largely consistent. Also, if you notice, my speed here is 118, and his Jolteon speed is 115. So it is giving me the ability to move first and use Wrap to knock it out. I'm also going to use Wrap on the Kadabra, then knock it out with a more consistent move, Wrap on the Jolteon to take it down to around half health, and then knock it out with a more accurate Surf. Just like with Starmie, I face four trainers in the Fuchsia City Gym. Koga himself is not that challenging. I'm going to get one hits on all the Venonats, and then likely get a two hit if the Venomoth goes for Psychic. If it goes for Leech Life, then I'm going to be taking less damage, and I'm going to be able to knock it out in three turns. That's the scenario that plays out today, so no more resets, only Misty and Surge so far. This is pretty good. If the early game is a little bit bumpy and the late game is smooth, this thing is still set to clock in with my best time yet. After picking up Mimic, which is going to be useful in this run, I fight Sabrina using Rap to defeat her fast Psychic-type Pokémon. Finally in this video, Blaine is easy because I have a Water-type move to defeat his Fire-types with. And Surf also trivializes Giovanni because I can just sweep through his team without a worry in the world. In Victory Road, I pick up the Rare Candy and then face the Cool Trainer that's just beyond it. This experience gives Tentacruel level 51, and I can use 4 Rare Candies to boost it up to level 55. The fight against Lorelei is still quite long for Tentacruel, but I have taught Mega Drain to speed things up a little bit. This ordinarily will give me a 3 hit against the Dugong and a 2 hit against the Cloyster. Beyond them, I play safe with Rap, knocking out the Slowbro, Jinx, and Lapras. The next battle, of course, is trivial, so let's talk about Agatha. I picked up Mimic specifically for this fight so that I could use Substitute with Tentacruel. It felt way too risky doing this without the move. The reason is, I'm going to have to knock out most of her Pokémon with a combination of Ice Beam and Surf. If the Gengar hits Psychic, I want to know that I can live through at least one turn. For damage ranges, I have two hits on all of her Pokémon except for the final Gengar. I have a 60% chance to knock it out in two hits, and a guaranteed three hit. This is the fight that has the highest potential to mess up Tentacruel's time. If I make it all the way to the final Gengar and get knocked out by Psychic and Dream Eater, then I lose a lot of time. In this case though, I crit the Gengar, ensuring that I get the two hit, and as a result, I defeat Agatha on my first attempt. Lance is really easy, you can use Wrap against the Gyarados to slowly chip it down, taking no damage, but I prefer going for Ice Beam, it doesn't really matter if it deals some damage to me. Also, you have the chance to freeze, which I get here, so I knock it out, and from there I sweep using Ice Beam on the remaining four Pokémon. Of course the Aerodactyl takes more damage from Surf, but I can serve more frames by using the same move over and over again. And that brings us to the champion, the second trainer that has the possibility of wasting a lot of time for Tentacruel. I only need three moves during this fight, Surf, Ice Beam, and Wrap. I could potentially add Rest for a little bit of consistency, but I think that that wastes time both on the SSN and here teaching the move. Plus, if I have to use it, it's a bit unfortunate because then I start bleeding time being asleep. 
Instead, I'm just going to one-shot the Sand Slash with Surf, use Wrap to bring the Alakazam down under half health, and then knock it out with Surf. This move does between 49 and 58% damage. Executor is next, and I made a small mistake with my playthrough here. I was going to teach Blizzard in the place of Ice Beam to get a better damage range against it, but I forgot because this is a last-minute optimization that I made after my 7th playthrough, and this is my 8th. With Ice Beam, Tentacruel is going to deal somewhere between 50 and 59% damage to the Executor, whereas with Blizzard it'll deal somewhere between 63 and 74% damage. This makes the fight more consistent because missing Wrap on the Executor is unacceptable. If it puts you to sleep with Hypnosis, the next move it will use is Leech Seed, due to how the AI works, and if it hits a Leech Seed, you lose. The reason is his next Cloister is going to use Spike Cannon while I knock it out with 3 turns of Surf. If Leech Seed stacks up damage during these turns, I'm just not going to have enough health. Also, the Cloister can crit. It does in this case, but luckily Tentacruel makes it past it. Next is Ninetales, which takes super effective damage from Surf. This is a guaranteed one hit. By the way, my worst possible damage range does 101% damage. So that's one reason Tentacruel needs level 59 for this Pokemon specifically. The other reason is that it has 185 speed. This was achieved by using 6 Carbos in total throughout the run. This gives me the outspeed on the Jolteon by 1 point. By doing that, I can use Wrap to take it down to the range that Surf has, which is between 46 and 55% damage. And with that, Tentacruel clocks in with no late game resets. It gets a final time of 44 minutes and 11 seconds, with two resets at level 59. This is a game time of 2 hours and 51 minutes. I was really happy with a sub 45 minute finish, because that means Tentacruel can join the other poison types in the S tier. Its time was not faster than Haunter, so today it gets itself the last spot. One thing I want to draw your attention to in the tier list is the fact that the S tier is exclusively poison and psychic types right now. I know these Pokemon have secondary types, grass, ghost, ground, and water, but I still think it's pretty neat as an observation. Do remember my tier list is always changing, I'm constantly re-ranking Pokemon, and if you want to see those playthroughs, check out my live streams. The official winner for this video, of course, is Starmie. That being said, I think both of these Pokemon performed extremely well, considering they have slow growth rates. As things currently stand, they are the only two slow growth rate Pokemon that are in the S tier. It is primarily dominated with medium slow growth rate Pokemon, Victory Bell, Gengar and Haunter, and both of the Nidos. The only medium fast Pokemon there is currently Hypno. That being said, these results with slow growth rate Pokemon today gives me a lot of hope for the eventual Mewtwo run. Looking at the splits graph for the final two playthroughs, I think we can see that I was really able to optimize Starmie's mid-game a lot more than I was with Tentacruel. The significant changes to counter grass types throughout this section of the game really benefited it. After that, Tentacruel also bleeds some time in the Rival 6 split doing optional battles. This is just so it can end the game and outspeed the Jolteon. The reason I decided not to face the Flareon team is just because Magneton takes a lot more time with Wrap, and if you miss one of the Wraps and it knocks you out with Thunderbolt or paralyzes with Thunder Wave, it is very frustrating. The Jolteon, on the other hand, has Pin Missile, which is super effective against Poison types, so it can just use that move instead of going for one of its more powerful Electric-type moves. Also, it has Thunder instead of Thunderbolt, which only has 70% accuracy, so it could just miss. I think this is the most reliable way to play Tentacruel. I think you could cut some corners, get a little bit more risky, and save some time. In the end, I still think that Starmie would perform better. If we look at this graph, which is levels by trainer, if I reduced Tentacruel's finish level, there isn't that much room for it to gain time. After all, there is always a minimum possible level to finish the game at if you are picking up rare candies. Throughout November, I've made my Fire Red series public. It used to be exclusive. Taking its place as exclusive content, I'm doing some behind the scenes videos where I do commentary to the complete playthroughs of Pokemon that I use in Versus videos. On the channel, there are already uploads for Weezing, Arbok, and Mux. So that's that's about 3 hours of content, and I have also uploaded videos for Pinsir and Scyther. Coming in the next 2 days will be videos for Starmie and Tentacruel as well, so if you want to see unedited playthroughs where I talk about my in-depth thought process at each stage of the game, please check those videos out. Okay, so if you made it this far, you're incredible. Thank you so much for watching. Now, let's talk about how these two Pokemon do against Professor Oak. For Tentacruel, the solution continues to be just use Wrap and win that way. 
I get a little bit risky against the Executor using Ice Beam. It could have put me to sleep with Hypnosis. In the end, it doesn't matter. Arcanine is simple, using Surf to knock it out. I go for Wrap against the Venusaur to chip it down so that it doesn't use Sleep Powder and then finish it with Ice Beam. After that, I continue using Ice Beam against the Gyarados and slowly finish it all. Stormy can set up with Badge Boost against the Tauros. It can also stack these up very high if it continues to choose moves like Tail Whip and Leer. If it eventually starts using Rage, then I can just set up for free because this move does so little damage. After that, I knock it out with Thunderbolt over two turns. Then, I can Blizzard the Executor for a single hit. Thunderbolt on the Arcanine, knocking it out over two turns. For the Venusaur, Blizzard again to one shot. And finally, I have made it to Gyarados but Starmie has 4 times damage, and it actually survives. The Gyarados is level 70, by the way. That being said, it has the same move pool that Lance's has, so it chooses Leer, and I knock it out. So with that, Starmie defeats Professor Oak. Today is the third last day in November. Tomorrow, I'm going to release the exclusive Starmie analysis video, and then the following day, I'm going to release the exclusive Tentacruel analysis video. Then, daily December starts. Throughout the entire month, I will be releasing one fully produced video every day. Thank you so much for supporting me over the last year. It really means the world to me that you watch these videos and we can keep the retro Pokemon games alive. I couldn't do this without an incredible community like all of you, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'll see you in the next video.